It's the week ending Saturday, the 12th of May, and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen Donald Trump pulling America out of the Iran nuclear deal, Sir Alex Ferguson hospitalised after a brain hemorrhage, and the This Is America video starring Donald Glover becoming a viral sensation. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And with me from the week's digital team are Holly Clements and Jamie Timpson. And well, why not? From the week junior, it's Felicity Capon. And starting the show this week, it's Holly. What do you think this week should be remembered for? There's an unwanted American pest heading to the UK, and it's not who you think. Most of their grain, be it wheat, maize, and even bananas and vegetables were being destroyed by this pest called the armyworm. It's multiplying by the day and it's feeding on everything green. It's destroying what's being expected to be probably 70% of all the grain in northwest Kenya. And if that goes, it means the people there will be staring a disaster indeed. Henry McKeewa from the charity World Vision speaking to the BBC World Service last year. Holly, this is the full army worm. I'm not familiar with his work. Uh, Explain what we're talking about here. He's misleadingly called a worm. He's actually a caterpillar that turns into a moth and reproduces at a staggering rate and can fly almost 100 kilometres a night, which makes it impossible to kind of contain which the americas have struggled with for centuries and now he's made his way to africa in 2016 how people don't know they suggest maybe on a plane is the theory but nobody's kind of narrowed it down and next up experts are thinking he might travel north to europe and possibly even the uk if we're warm enough it's devastated parts of africa agriculture in africa has been wiped out loads of crops lots of people have been left hungry and experts say it has the potential to spread across the world causing a global food crisis okay that sounds like a pretty big story really that has fallen under the radar here hasn't it so devastating crops in kenya but i suppose the news this week is it could be coming here it could come to the uk too okay guys what are we going to do about this jamie There was a panel of experts commissioned by the European Commission to find out whether or not it would be coming across to Europe. I think the the key answer is that because it started in Americas and there are countries in the Americas that have dealt with it quite well. So Brazil, for instance, have been using a kind of variety of pesticides and resistant crops basically to the worm for quite a long time but there hasn't been that many that much um, sharing of information between the nations so actually it's only very recently that Brazil has sent experts from their crop management teams to Africa to help them with what it is I, I think I think basically the idea is that we have to start using pesticides earlier to kind of indoctrinate the the reason that, it, that the Americans have been able to battle it so well is that they use pesticides whereas obviously in the UK and the EU we're not such big fans of the, of them it's also genetically modified crops which the Americas are more pro whereas Europe and Africa are very hesitant to use genetically modified crops and they've developed crops to actually be resistant like Jamie says to the pest okay hesitate to use the metaphor let's open that can of worms but i've done it (laughs) felicity (laughs) inside that can of worms is that something we should be looking at then genetically modified crops in europe quite possibly i think the problem with this is that from what i've read is that there doesn't seem to be one solution to this problem i think there's so many ideas that have been kind of flaunted as a way of of containing this pest that but no one's quite sure and i also think one of the um insecticides that they want to use they have to get approval regulatory approval that's quite difficult I think also the countries that are affected I mean the Central African Republic it's in long simmering civil war you've got Zimbabwe in economic freefall Zambia political instability so I suppose a lot of the countries that are being affected they're sort of scrambling to find a way to have the funding to have the communication to sort of stop this problem I also feel like it's only once it's sort of threatening Europe that it becomes a story I mean this has been going on since the whole of like the articles I were reading were from last year and it just seems one of those things that once it's sort of a threat to Britain we, we get terribly worried about it I mean I suppose that's because Holly you know sad as it is to say basically you know every five or ten years a new thing comes along that's going to kill many African children and it's almost like you know patch it with one whatever barrel load of aid or new government or whatever and then something else comes along it can get to the stage in the west where people look at these stories and just think maybe it would be positive for africa if it does come towards europe and they get more help from europe because we suddenly wake up to the fact that it's happening 
maybe like Ebola. I think a lot of it is money, obviously, because individual farmers can't afford the pesticides or they're trying to make it themselves as people have died trying to make pesticides children are making pesticides people with like not the right equipment trying to create chemicals that they shouldn't be handling Mm, which they then are going to eat of course yeah of course and then spraying incorrectly they need a lot of help from maybe the government giving them money but as you say if it gets to europe and people actually start taking notice of it i think another Another reason why it hasn't really been noticed that much is that a lot of the people that are affected are subsistence farmers. So I know like in Ghana where it happened, it was like 60% of the farming is subsistence. So it means that the only real people that are being affected by this problem are Ghanaians because they're not exporting the crops and, you know, we we have our own imports from different countries. And so actually it's been very localised, this problem, until now. But it's funny because there was another story this week about how South Georgia has finally rid itself of rats, which has been a massive problem for centuries. They've overtaken this tiny island way out. It's a British overseas territory near Antarctica, which for centuries has just been overrun with rats, destroying the the natural native wildlife. It's been a massive problem. And this week they finally announced that they've got rid of them due to poison pellets and traps. But I mean, it wasn't affecting people or farmers like is is the case in Africa. Mm. And it's really interesting, you know, invasive species are, are a problem the world over. But yeah, it just made me think, wow, this massive sort of good news story for an island where actually it's not going to affect people, where in Africa it's a massive, massive problem for ordinary ordinary people. And I suppose, Holly, the other thing that countries around the world can do is be a bit tighter about their agricultural customs policy, right? So from what I've read, there has been an example of some crops or some food coming from one of those African countries, I think it was Kenya, into Europe. And, you know, the, the crops were seized and it noticed that yeah, there was think, this caspillary inside. Customs have been good at trying to get rid of it, but they could literally fly like they've they've got such power to fly such distances they could potentially come up into Europe they're actually worried about populations of moths coming into the country not Mm. just one moth on some food coming in in package it does make you think it it, it is quite scary it does make you think as a traveler as well you know I'm quite cavalier about those signs you know when you get to the airport and it says you know throw away the apple that you just brought with you from the country you've been you just think oh for god's sake I had a worm in the apple had a worm in it (laughs) but presumably that's the kind of thing I mean obviously not just one but if someone brought across two and they made it that's all you need to do isn't it like clothes as well yeah you know any clothes that you're wearing out there you know I mean they're not that they could but certainly some insects can travel through in jumpers and whatever you want to take abroad. Not that you'd be wearing jumpers in the but, middle of Africa. But. but I suppose that's the problem with invasive species is that it, it's about our changing world as well. I mean, I suppose an increase in international trade and travel kind of facilitates these kind of biological invasions and makes it a lot easier. And with the full army worm, I think it's also climate change is kind of creating the perfect storm because Africa now is seeing a lot of periods of drought followed by lots of rain, which I think scientists think is a result of climate change. And that's absolutely perfect for army worms. And likewise with South Georgia, it was glaciers there, which kind of made it easier to establish natural killing zones and sort of borders. And these glaciers are melting and that can make it a lot. If a rat does get back to South Georgia, they could easily, easily breed again. It seems to me, though, Holly, this is the kind of story that lots of developed countries would want to intervene with because it makes their scientists and their engineers and their agriculturalists look cool, doesn't it? There's no political problem with intervening to help countries where children are dying because they can't eat because an animal's eating their crops. That seems like a, a good news story that like lots of countries could work together with to solve. Why isn't that happening? You'd hope so. I mean, there are. There's a guy called Professor Kenneth Wilson at the University of Lancaster Environment Centre who's trying to develop a virus. He found one that would kill the African army worm, but it's a slightly different version to the full army worm and he's trying to develop something now but he says it could still take years and again it's funding I imagine is the problem with science. Well and I think also what a lot of people are resistant to is that argument about GM crops and you know the battle about whether or not we should start using genetically modified um, foods and everything and actually what's happened is that we've our kind of cultural aversion within Europe has been transported to, uh, kind of across Africa. At least that's what some people have been telling me. I think there is a, an element of kind of worry that maybe is unfounded. Growing up, I've had a thing of like not liking genetic modified crops and everything. But maybe this is the turning point that means that people start saying, well, actually, if that's probably OK. I mean, it's a big maybe, isn't it? Because we don't know what the results of eating GM crops would be long term. That's why there's a suspicion about them. So it's putting it in the balance, isn't it? If everyone's going to go hungry because a caterpillar's eating all the maize, then I suppose you might 
tip the balance there. But yeah. it, it's an unknown. I mean, it's still an unknown, isn't it? No one knows what GM crops might do to us long term. Well, yeah, I guess you could look to the Americas where they have been using them to see, but there's probably still many years to come to review it. And if we are going to have Brexit, we might be the ones that, you know, take our GM crops, say goodbye to our cultural aversion in Europe turn our noses up and welcome GM crops. Jamie, you're next. What do you think the story of the week is? This was the week we took one step closer to war, but not where you think. So we are concerned. I mean, we have, as you know, consistently called on all claimants, including China, to refrain from unilateral aggressive actions that are inconsistent with international law and norms. Uh, We have called on countries to refrain from reclamation and militarization of reclaimed land, and we will continue to do so. That was Sung Kim, US ambassador to the Philippines, speaking this week about America's concerns in the South China Sea. So, Jamie, we've uh, we've all been focused on Iran and North Korea. Your story this week is we've been looking in the wrong place. We should all be really worried about China. Yes. Yes. Not for the first time on this podcast. We should be really worried about China. But this week in the South China Sea, there's a a kind of contested set of islands, Spratly Islands and the Paracel Islands, but it's all within the South China Sea. So kind of quite close to the Philippines, that kind of area between Mm. China and there. And the Chinese this week deployed another set of military aircrafts onto one of their bases. So up until now, they have promised they are not militarizing, but the Vietnamese government have asked China to to move those aircrafts away. Basically, the the history of it is that it's a kind of disputed territory, but a key trading throughway for ships and and everything, because basically it allows everyone to get from the south of China, around Africa and up into Europe uh, eventually. The kind of main debate over who owns it is that China has been pushing its territorial boundaries outwards, wanting to take control, whereas Vietnam, the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia and Brunei all have competing claims to the to the area. What do the islanders think? So they're not actually that inhabited. So they are just an area of kind of territorial. uh, But the the Vietnamese claim that they've had and been in control and have had people on there since the 17th century. China disputes this. The Philippines say that a couple of the islands are theirs and uh, China and actually a UN arbitration panel found in the Philippines favour recently, but the Chinese weren't having any of it. I guess that strategy works both ways, though, doesn't it? You can say the Chinese only want it because it's strategically closer to Vietnam and the Philippines. But you could also say, presumably... The Filipinos and the Vietnamese only want it because it's strategically closer to China. Yeah, and the US, even though you might think, what are they doing over there? They have been sending ships through the areas that are contested as a kind of freedom navigation thing, which the Chinese have seen as a bit of a kind of uh, provocation, I guess. But I, perhaps the thing that's most worrying was that Steve Bannon, although he said a lot of things, Steve Bannon, former Donald Trump advisor, said last year in an interview that we, we are going to war in the South China Sea within the next five or ten years. OK, let's take that head on, shall we? Holly, are we going to war in the South China Sea in the next five to ten years? We can hope not. It's a confusing I message. I didn't ask you what you hope. <laughs> I'm asking you whether Jamie is bringing us something that's bunkum or it, relevant. It's a possibility. China might feel like they, they've got strength over America and that maybe America won't care as much. They're the ones that want to change the status quo, whereas America just wants to keep it how it is, keep their seas open so that they can trade. That's their main aim. Whereas China wants to expand, so they're the ones that maybe will come head on. Felicity? I don't think we are. Good. I certainly don't think it would be a deliberate conflict. I think there could be an accidental escalation, which I think we've seen flashpoints in the past. But I mean, it's going back to the 1970s, if not older, that there have been flashpoints in the air and it's never really come to massive blows. I think as far as the US is concerned, it's in a way more strategic position than China. Its military bases give it a very strong presence. Its navy is about 15 years ahead of China's. I don't think it's it's much of a match. I think the other important thing is the way China has has gone about it, sort of salami slicing tactics. It's sort of been militarising the area in a very piecemeal fashion. So it's sort of making it hard for other countries to say, oh, China's gone way too far, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle. It's like, 
if you were on an aeroplane and someone was sort of gently nudging your elbow off your armrest, but only very, very gently. <laughs> and, and there's no point where you can suddenly stand up in outrage and say, something has to be done about this. It's very, very subtle. Mm. And I think because of that, China's getting away with an awful lot. And the other thing I think is that China has got so much power and clout in the region. There's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and at summits, other countries that are sort of contest what China's doing, such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, they've tried to put together joint statements condemning China. But China is very successfully lobbying these countries, offering substantial investment, and they just back off. I mean, they are such a powerful country that, cynical thing to say, but actually whether or not they have control of these islands is such a footnote, isn't it, anyway, for the reasons Felicity says, you know, they have so much sort of creeping power anyway, they have a reasonable relationship actually with Trump's US don't they at the moment even though he'll say that they don't want so much manufacturing to be controlled there and so actually in the grand scheme of things China is the superpower in that area so actually what difference does it make? I think that that while that would have been the case you know maybe a year or a year and a half ago I think the the trade war the the tariffs you know this week it turned out that that China had has stopped buying any US soybean and that's a huge decrease in terms of in terms of their trade and I think that as we get further into this, what is a burgeoning global trade war, there will be times when the people who have their finger on the on the button, you know, President Xi Jinping and, and Donald Trump, could at any moment escalate it into a full-blown war. And I think, you know, certainly from what some of the research has, has said, you know, with Beijing constantly trying to push out and like the salami slicing tactics, mm-hmm. eventually someone is going to have to step up and say, no, this isn't acceptable. You know, we actually, the UK, that is, have said that we're going to send a warship through next year. This is not uh, something that will go down well with China. You know, China aren't going to... They, they see this as rightfully theirs, you know. I mean, I guess they think, clues in the name, it's not called the South US Sea, is it? So they, they have that feeling where this could be something that I think they'd be prepared to go to war about. Yeah, but you need the support of the US public as well, don't you, to get the USA that. army involved. And there hasn't been the, the mission creep that there has been with other territories like see. Iran, like Korea, where you can see there's a rhetoric you can say, oh, for years we've been saying this is the red line, they've crossed it. No one's aware of this issue in America. It's not going to be a domestically popular for Trump, and he's very against. But if the food start, if food prices go up, you know, if the tariff war che- if the tariff war makes people poorer in the U.S. and Trump blames it on China, suddenly you've got a motive. PR, PR yeah. strategy to tell people why they're doing it. Yeah, because yeah. so far he hasn't shown much interest in any other countries other than the U.S. And I think the extent of feeling within China actually is very, very strongly that I think when you look at the history of China in the 20th, 20th century, going back to the first opium war, humiliations in World War II. I think this is something that the Chinese people feel very, very strongly about. I think there's a lot of nationalist fervor. So on the one hand, if the US public aren't that bothered, I think on the other hand, you certainly have the Chinese public who very much are bothered. OK, before we abandon this story and don't talk about it again for another two years, what's the thing that listeners should be looking out for in this story as a developing consequence that could mean that we're getting closer to war? Because it is, it seems to me, quite a fringe issue from our perspective. I think I think the kind of continued militarization. So what you would see would be China, the cruise missiles that they're placing, it would be a strike that they did because of an infringement on their territory or whatever. That would be the thing to look out for, a strike on a, a foreign territory. Because like you said, it has happened since the 70s. You know, Vietnam lost 60 sailors. And then in, in I think it was 82. And then in later in the 90s, there was another conflict. So I think there could be a spark. You know, I'm sure people were sitting around saying, oh, God, you know, Aunt Archduke Franz Ferdinand, he'll be fine. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, Finally, this week, uh, let's retire to the drawing room with Felicity's story. (laughs) This week, beware the Jaluminati. My name is Jack Solomon. I'm 15 years old and I am a jewel user. We got them from an older kid and we... He was teaching me how to use it and stuff and I got the hang of it. Like, I was able to, like, inhale the smoke without coughing and get a nice head rush. And I was like, this thing is priceless, it's amazing. And I was like, I gotta show all my friends what this thing is. That was Jack Solomon, a 15-year-old Juul user, speaking to campaign group Jewelers Against Juul. Uh, Felicity, before we go any further, help this old man. What is (laughs) Jeweling? 
Juuling uh, in this day and age, it's a form of vaping. So okay. it's supposed to be a replacement for ordinary cigarettes. It looks like a USB stick. It doesn't look like a, an ordinary cigarette, which is why it's proving immensely popular in America with younger people because older folk are finding it hard to detect what it is. It also doesn't emit that much smoke, so you can sort of discreetly oh, have wow. a puff in. So it doesn't have the sort of simulated golden bit at the end that's glowing? No, no None it of doesn't. That. It looks like a bit of a hardware device or something. It's very small, very discreet. Okay. The difference, I suppose, with cigarettes is that it takes out the tar, it takes out the carbon monoxide and all the things that give you cancer, but it leaves in the highly addictive nicotine each pod you buy a pod to go in your jewel contains about the same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes and this is sort of sweeping across america and some people are very very bothered about it okay so it's a pod based system so for anyone listening who's as old as me it's like nespresso free cigarettes yeah yeah Happy yeah why not okay um <laughs> and the kids like it and it's sweeping america so what e-cigarettes are safe aren't they I think that's the thing. This is a lot safer than than cigarettes. And the problem with ordinary smoking in America is still absolutely massive. So 1,300 people die from smoking every single day. And someone likened that to, imagine three jumbo jets crashing every single day with no survivors. So if you're comparing it to cigarettes, yes, they are an awful lot safer. But is that the only comparison that should be made? Well, that's (laughs) true, isn't it, Holly? Is it fair to compare any smoking alternative to smoking since smoking is pretty much the most dangerous thing you can voluntarily do. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at the UK because I think the next generation coming up is rising teetotalism, fewer young people are smoking, which compared to my day seems like a positive. And I guess if their one vice is an e-cigarette, I think that that's better. But uh, yeah, I guess it's all a all context. If, you, big- if you're choosing it rather than a cigarette, it's great, but... If you were going for a run instead, <laughs> it's not. There's a big problem, isn't there, with the idea of like the gateway drug thing. You know, that's the reason that I think that people are in America, parents are getting angry. I mean, apart from the fact that it's that thing of like, oh, what are they doing? You know, it's the same over here with the Ferrari around Noz canisters or hippie crack, as the son called it, where people are unsure of something that young people are doing. Mm. And so it frightens them. So then they vilify them. And I think that that's possibly what's happening here in the sense that this whole system is done illicitly. You know, I think that the whole gateway drug thing has been found to be a myth, particularly with things like marijuana. Your propensity to do harder drugs is much less to do with whether or not you smoked marijuana and much more to do with your social class or how much money you have. But there is in people's minds this thing of like, well, if they're dueling at 15, you know, who knows what they'll be doing at 19? I don't who know if it, knows what they'll be doing at 22? That. The, the, the whole slippery slope argument is based on actually your contact with drug dealers, isn't it? It's not about your propensity psychologically or physiologically. It's about the fact that you meet a drug dealer regularly and he or she might sell you something else. And with Juul, it seems like the concern would be once you get used to the idea of putting in a pod of nicotine, maybe you'll put in a pod of something else. That's that's the point. I think it's it? very yeah. difficult. But I think it's very difficult. As far as I know, you know, I've only, I've only read briefly, but the... You haven't been duelling cocaine just before you came on the show. I'm very disappointed. It is very difficult to (laughs) adapt these duels to smoke cocaine. Fine, but you see where the fear comes from, right? You can smoke marijuana with them, I heard. (laughs) And I think there's also the danger that companies can create bogus and pirated versions that aren't being regulated and no one knows what's in them. And also the idea that one bad habit promotes another so that, you know, there are fears that drinking and duelling go together. And also nicotine, especially on brains that young, you are changing the makeup of the brain forever. It's Mm. so highly addictive that that's then set in for the rest of your life. So I think there are legitimate worries and dangers, but I do think it's so so ironic in a way that, you know, kids in American schools these days, I think that the dangers that they're facing are probably a bit bigger than than duelling. Uh, but, but vaping is a thing here, isn't it? My local high street in the village where I live now has a vape shop where there used to be an optician and it is clearly aimed... Every, every small town now has yeah. a vape shop. Like, it's taken over, I think, any kind of supermarket or anything as being the one thing that every town will have. And what would you say the demographic is in that vape shop? Because in the one near me, it's entirely 15 and 16 year olds. Yes, yeah, it's young. It's so much that's, younger. whatever you say about, oh, there's a hysteria about this and young people taking up smoking, it is true, isn't it? If we were having this discussion 10 years ago, 
us or our equivalents on a show like this would be saying, oh, don't worry. E-cigarettes are there for people that are already addicted to smoking. They'll never be glamorous and teenagers will never take it up. But they clearly have but and they clearly think it's But sexy. it's also being promoted to young people because they come in these flavours like mango flavour and cool cucumber. It's clearly being marketed at young people. So the whole idea that these were supposed to be a healthy alternative to adults who are already smoking and mm. to wean them off that clearly is erroneous. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's capitalism, isn't it? That's the problem. Is that as soon as you can sell, as soon as you can sell something like that, and not as a health thing, but as a product, as something that you can entice people to buy. So here's the trap we're in: Do we regulate e-cigarettes as tightly as we regulate actual cigarettes? Because they're not, as far as we know, cancer causing. So you can't put the labels on saying this is going to kill your unborn child. Do you stop people in music videos smoking vape cigarettes because it looks a bit like a real cigarette? Like, where do you draw the line? I think it depends. It, we need some more research into what damage it does actually cause. I wonder as well if young people, because it's hard to know whether they were going to take up cigarettes rather than e-cigarettes, mm. it's hard to know if it is damaging or whether it's actually a bonus in a way that they're not smoking real cigarettes. And maybe they do need to be vilified because young people wouldn't be doing it if they thought it was really great and their parents wanted them to do it. (laughs) In a way, if they're going to choose that over cigarettes, it's better that we are having a little bit of hysteria to goad them into into doing the right thing. And there's a really interesting piece in The New Yorker about this this week, wasn't there, where the lady who wrote the piece interviewed a load of teenagers about why they smoke this stuff. And a lot of them said basically irony, which... You know, it's something that you can't regulate for because they seem to think it's cool basically to post an Instagram picture about how they might be furthering their own death. So there's nothing you can do about that. No, I mean, uh, but that's that's the great comedic genius of teenagers, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Are they a bit like the Alka Pops of the 90s? In other words, you can have a big crisis meeting now about regulating them, but they'll just die out in five years anyway because then they won't be cool. Um, Alka Pops not cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was still drink them. <laughs> I hope not, because I think actually e-cigarettes are, can play a really big part in stopping people smoking. And I think that was one of the things that Public Health England had to do at the end of last year was bring out this big campaign saying e-cigarettes are great. If you're a smoker, e-cigarettes are great. Like because lots of people were either continuing smoking or not taking up e-cigarettes as a serious thing because they were worried about the health risks. And so I think there is a definite role. I know people that have taken up vaping since having started smoking and it has worked for them. And so I think there is a definite role to play for e-cigarettes, but maybe not for 15, 16, 17 year olds. Uh, There was a lovely quote in, I think it was that New York, New York article of someone who was advocating for Jewel who said that smoking used to be the wolf in sheep's clothing and that Jewel is now the other way around, that we're sort of seeing this, we're sort of getting very hysterical about this massive threat, but it might be the best thing to solve the massive crisis that is still smoking normal cigarettes. Mm. I should just actually ask you all your smoking histories. I'm looking at you, Jamie, because that voice... Sounds fag tinted. <laughs> no, that, I actually, I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never been a regular smoker. Okay, any of you? My parents listen to the show. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, I was a terrible teenager. Okay. and smoked a lot, but I now actually. How did you give up? It. I didn't struggle giving it up. I think I did it because I was a teenager and I just wanted to rebel against grown up people. Felicity? <laughs> no, I haven't really. Really? I mean, maybe a bit of social smoking to sort of look cool, but nothing, anything serious. Okay. But all my parents and grandparents did. It, it's amazing how how much that has changed. Over I, I mean, I think what we're, we're all saying is anyone who's still smoking is, is just weak. Uh, that is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. I'm off to buy myself a massive pack of strawberry hooch. My thanks to Felicity Capon, Jamie Timpson and Holly Clements. If you enjoy this show, then take a moment, do it now, to review us and rate us and subscribe to us on your podcast app. That is what helps other people know about the show. And for even more from The Week, visit theweek.co.uk for our free email newsletter the weekday or to get the magazine delivered direct to your door. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. Until we meet again to unwrap next week. Bye-bye.